Just walk <laughs> up and down when you feel sleepy. <laughs> but I trust this body will be interesting because we're looking at when women have reached their end. So we have four presenters, and they're all here. And because I'm Nigerian and I'm still trying to get used to this name, she will help me so that I don't mess the names up. <laughs> I know Mpo, Mpo is the second speaker. She will be um, presenting on nakedness as a decolonial crisis. Yeah, and she was presenting on when women have reached the, the end of their politics, nakedness as resistance. And then when Nani will be speaking on a critical unmasking of the me. The case of Boniswa. Then Charlene is speaking on um, in memorial, um, memento mori. Um, our narrativization and the lines of proximity should thinking on gender violence. So our speakers have 20 minutes each and we'll take all the sessions and uh, do our feedback. Okay, go ahead. Okay, hello everyone. Hi. Hello. Hi. Um, so, number one, I just want to say that this paper comes out of an African feminism course at Rhodes University by truly the great um, Shingirai Mutero. Um, so I just wanted to really give kudos to her um, for this work that she's really doing within the course. Um, so just my structure, I'll be giving you guys the aims. So what is it after this presentation that you guys should have come out of this presentation with? My introduction, I will be conceptualizing the naked female body within the African context. Um, tracing nakedness then as resistance and reaching your end unruly politics um, and you know, a point of departure then what is it that once we have left this room what can we start thinking about um, so this is my aims I want us to understand the nature of the white patriarchal gaze and how this has informed how the, the, the African woman's body particularly the naked African woman's body is viewed in society. So I'm really going to be going um, in terms of you know the framing and what then orders our frame in society. Um, I want us to understand how the naked black African female body destabilizes heteronormative society. Um, and thirdly, I want us to understand that okay, if we say that the naked body has been constructed in this way, I also want to argue that, in fact, nakedness in the African context has been used as a tool for political resistance. Mm -hmm. um, so this thing, it's not a new age, you know, radical feminist thing, as people like to say it. Really, it's not a thing of, you know, Sikolei feminism in Morocco. It's something that, in fact, our mothers, our grandmothers have been doing for centuries, right? So it's nothing new. Um, and, and I think here, I also just want to go off of the thing of, you know, this intergenerational thing that we have been speaking about today, that in fact, this is a long and we know this, we know that our mothers have been doing this, okay? Um, so just an introduction, right, to the paper. Um, within my paper and just throughout, I really focus on this thing of the gaze, right? This white male European gaze, right? And that is really... Um, what informs a lot of this thing because um, who, Oyunka Oyokumi just argues that in fact in the West the gaze that is prioritized or rather what is prioritized is what can be seen. So automatically I see you, you are you know, however you are and automatically I draw inferences from what I see. So automatically I put meaning for that thing that can be seen. Yeah? Um, so just Bear with me as we walk along this thing then. And so the idea that really the body in its physical form and um, that physical form then informing how we read it and the value of, of, of how we read this thing is then what informs social order. So automatically if you are black, if you are a woman, if you are maybe voluptuous, right, then automatically that thing places you somewhere within the social order of society. Um, and so ultimately, I go off this vantage point that what has been prioritized is what is inherently and immediately sexual, right? Where black women have really, for centuries, been sexualized inherently and immediately without actually understanding um, what is happening there. And we've taken this and we've ran with it in society. 
Um, and so I want to argue that the difference in African society is that historically nakedness has been used to resist. Um, additionally, I also argue that this particular kind of resistance disrupts the heteronormative organization of society. Um, and so I want to also problematize that even when we resist and our traditional modes of resistance actually do not see women within that frame, right? And so what nakedness does is that it actually disrupts this heteronormative organization of resistance. And so conceptualizing the naked female body, how do we view this person in society, right? The black woman in particular. So I want to argue that, number one, in the same way that gender, we argue that it is a social construct, in fact it definitely is a social construct, right? I argue that in the same way that we do that, we can also argue that nakedness is also a social construct, yes. right? So in the West, what has been prioritized and the way that the naked body has been constructed there has been to see this visual thing, right? That biological differences are what are prioritized. Yeah? And then how that, like I've said before, informs our ordering in society. Yeah? Um, so ultimately then we read the body in accordance to a Western frame. Um, and so I then see, in fact we, we all see this, not that I I don't take Truly, it's not my idea. We see this in society, it's happening, right? That in fact, the male body is what's given credibility. So we see men as being the people who are the thinkers, who are the ones who are able to insert themselves within the political, right? And we don't see women in that same way, right? We, the, the woman is, the, is embodied and really their bodies are not credible. Yeah? Um, so I want to really push uh, against this frame and I use the work of Oyomumi Amadume, Bibi Bakari Yusuf, even Sylvia Tamale to really push against what we've come to accept as the norm of how we view um, black women in society. So I argue that definitely in African societies this thing of prioritizing biology, the implications of biology don't carry much weight. Right, and I think we can really see this just generally, even in our own societies, and, and what that brings. Yeah? So for us, nakedness is nothing bizarre. We we know this, right? Personally, I also argue even throughout my paper that in fact, um, you know, in terms of even just looking geographically and the climate of Africa, right, where clothes, the, it, it, it's you know, geographically, climatically. It doesn't. It didn't make sense, and so that Victorian style of dressing to you know have this big poofy thing, right? That came from the West, right? And so I think that for us to be naked was nothing bizarre. It's nothing innately sexual. Um, it's not uncivilized, right? Um, and so forth. And I think we also see this even in terms of how, for example, when we have our own traditional sort of ceremonies and so forth, do you tell us that definitely I can, you know, be within that space and not have my top on, right, and be topless. And that's not innately sexual. Yeah? Um, so yeah, ultimately just all of this and what we come to view it now as has definitely been socially constructed. So, I use, um, I employ the use of three case studies. I use the Kenyan Great Green Belt Movement. I use um, the Liberian Women's Mass Action for Peace. And then I use the Naked Protest um, from our reference list, right, at the university. Definitely shakefully known as well. Um, so, just to, and, and the thinking behind using these three case studies, right, I mean, obviously I, I am from, from Rhodes. But I wanted to, and you'll see this as I move as well, that in terms of the, the case study of Liberia and Kenya, I really um, try to understand how motherhood might inform the way that we view nakedness or the naked you know, female body, how age is also a factor, um, also just in terms of the institution that Rhodes is placed in, the institution that is Rhodes, right? And in fact, it definitely being a white institution and what that means when protests such as those happen at Rhodes University. Yeah? Um, 
So, yeah, so basically, yeah, just to start with the Kenyan Green Belt Movement and give you guys a brief background, um, the Kenyan Green Belt Movement was basically founded by environmentalist and feminist um, Uwa Mari Mathai. Um, it was a response to this, and we've spoken about this throughout the conference as well, this sort of ecological destruction, right, by definitely white um, capital. Yeah? So this sort of movement of the Kenyan Green Belt movement was a response to that ecological destruction. Yeah? Because in Kenyan society, the people that, you know, work the land, the people that get subsistence from the land are the women. Yeah? And so there, when there is ecological destruction, the people that feel it first and most, you know, immediately and stronger are the women. So that sort of eco-feminist movement was a it was a sort of response to this thing that we call you know bread and butter politics, this tangible politics, because what was happening there definitely affected their livelihoods, their ability to actually sustain their families. Um, so I, I, I use that then as an important tool. But also the naked protest in terms of the Kenyan Green Belt movement wasn't um, a sort of, uh, so the mode of resistance used there wasn't automatically a naked protest, right? Um, the choice for the women to strip naked in 1992 in downtown um, Nairobi, Kenya, was the culmination of a number of things, right? So we see that within these protests, it isn't necessarily something that might automatically happen just out of the blue, right? Most of the time there has been a constant violation of women, a constant, you know, oppression of women, and that builds up into that moment, and we see that within the Kenyan Green Belt movement. So it was motivated by the point of, some might argue, a point of desperation. That's that's a point of contention, um, and the women face an immediate danger from um, police violence, right? And we see this because police and the state react violently towards black women. Yeah? Um, and so I say that traditionally in African societies, um, the naked body and a woman stripping in public, particularly if this woman is a mother, not necessarily in the biological sense, right? Because anything we said that biology doesn't carry much weight, in fact, in our societies, right? So, ubang mama, right? In fact, definitely. If, even if you do not carry me biologically, you are my mother. And I must, wherever I see you, if I see umama on pagelai on the timolo ma, right, because of mama. Ne? So that carries a symbolic meaning, this thing of motherhood in African society. Um, and so also, if you are a mother or if you are an elderly woman, if you are married as well, um, there's a sort of thing there that happens in terms of the symbolism of your identities there, where um, you can invoke the sort of curse of nakedness, right? To say that you have brought me so much shame, you have brought me so much violence, so much turmoil, so much hurt, that I'm left with no other choice but to disrobe because I've reached that point, right? So this is what that paper is about, to reach that point where I can deny it, um, So basically what this curse of nakedness does is that particularly when the naked body is displayed in public, it sort of, um, it negates the life that as the mother you brought into this world, because I'm bringing shame upon you, the one who has hurt me, right? Um, and it conveys a message that those in power are dead to me. Um, and so I think here also we see this sort of political agency that women have, which is demonstrated by this ability to recognize this age-old African belief of the curse of nakedness, right? And use it, in fact, in terms of collective action, né? and actually select this particular tool, because it's been within us. So that's something that I want us to remember, that we use this tool that has been within our African society. Né? Um, and then I move to the Liberian Women's Mass Action for Peace, um, which was, you know, one of the most prominent leaders there was Ulema Kowi, but of course there are many other women um, who are involved. And so here I also want to say that traditionally, right, 
the mode of, re of resistance that's often been accepted in society, this sort of military, you know, statist sort of approach, right? Um, whereby an immediate threat is prioritized over a sustainable peace. Yeah. And one of the things that the, that the women in Liberia also fought for was actually this thing of, we want to see how that transition actually happens, right? We want to see and be there and actually monitor this thing and see that actually as women we are prioritized within this sort of um, negotiation happening, right? So what happened there was that, um, you know, the delegates and so forth had been negotiating, but they were really living their best lives, right? Mm -hmm. Living in the hotels there, chilling, charging the money, and which is really what men do. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, and, and not actually understanding that women are under threat. Mm. You know, the fact that rape as a weapon of war was something happening on a daily basis. Right? To have to, I mean, I mean there were pregnant women who were, who were killed and that, that baby just torn out of your stomach, like, so, so the violence mm. there, right? that there's something that the men at the negotiations weren't understanding about the impact of that violence. Um, and so there, even just this threat to strip naked, right, where Abo Lema Gowi and, and her peers were there, in fact, so what I want us to understand in this, in this, in this thing of, of nakedness, right, that it's not necessarily this, um, I am taking off everything, or I am, do you understand what I'm saying? Yeah? It's not necessarily that, but a mother, in the clear, for me to say, in fact, it's like you are putting me through a lot, right? The only clear I am, that act has, I'm cursing your existence there, right? You brought me so much pain. Yeah? So, so even like when we think about nakedness, I don't want us to understand it in a sort of, um, sort of one-dimensional um, image in our mind. Yeah. Because I also think that that is what has informed this dominant idea of um, oh, uh, women at roads are seeking attention, or, oh, this and this, you know, because it isn't one dimensional, right? So I want us to, to remember that. Um, yeah, so I want us to also. Position the, the, positioning the naked female body in terms of as it being an act of resistance, right? I want us to understand that what this does is that it demonstrates this very political act, right? It inserts the personal into the political, right? Which in fact, that distinction shouldn't even be there in the first place, yeah? So what it does is that it takes this body that has been the site of violence, right? That is sort of automatically assumed to be only belonging in the personal, in the bedroom for male consumption and for male viewing, right? So as soon as we see the sort of, uh, that body in the public sort of light where men have not set the rules and the terms of engagement for that, we see that it starts to destabilize society. Which is why I say that nakedness and seeing that body in the public, it destabilizes heteronormative organizational resistance. Yeah? Because men, you know, patriarchal society sort of says that these are the terms of engagement that we need to be having, and as soon as you step beyond that, then it's a short circuit. Yeah? Um, and then the woman at Rhodes University. Um, yeah, I, I, yeah. Um, okay, so here, I'm not sure if I should maybe, maybe let me just briefly explain. Um, have three minutes. I have three. <laughs> okay. okay, so basically, here I think I really wanted to highlight the backlash of the media in terms of the gays, mm -hmm. um, specifically, to say that these women are attention seeking to, to, to highlight this thing of, oh, saggy breasts, oh, she has yeah. breasts, mm -hmm. you know, this thing of automatically it's the male gaze that is prioritized, what can be seen, mm -hmm. and it doesn't see the sort of meaning making that is done behind that, yeah? mm -hmm. um, So women reaching the end, and really politics, yeah? So I want to say that the, 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 the naked female body has been wrongfully constructed. In fact, let's delete that whole thing. Yeah? Um, 
History tells us that definitely black women have used the naked body as a tool to convey a message, right? Um, and we see this in the curse of nakedness, like I've said, we see this in terms of the importance of the element of motherhood, of age, which is why I position Liberia and Kenya, and I group those things together, right? And I position Yuka sort of in a different light, right? Because I, I think that at Rhodes, because this protest was primarily by young women, because it was at a white institution, it's bizarre to think that in fact sexual violence would take place within this campus that we've so much you know, protected. You know, it's, it's bizarre to think that even a student would be the one to perpetuate that violence. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, yeah, and so, like I said before, the reactions from society are evidence of this reading of the women's bodies as void of political thought. You are seeking attention, there's no political strategy there, yeah. right? You see, this thing of automatically negating women's minds. Um, and definitely sexualizing the protest as well. And so, I wanna say that nakedness is interpreted differently in society within varying contexts, um, when disrobing is enacted by different people, right? When white women disrobe, I argue that it destabilizes society in a different way than it does for black women. Um, and when mothers disrobe, it destabilizes society in a different way than it does when black young women disrobe. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. But ultimately, all of these things, because of the white patriarchal society we live in, is that all of them are threatening and destabilizing a yeah. All in their different ways, but a community does the same thing, mm -hmm. right? Um, so it becomes threatening when women decide to define the terms of engagement, right? When I say that, in fact, I want to, you know, um, use this form of protest. Um, so ultimately, it moves beyond the rigidity and binary of this personal versus the political, right? It, is, it moves beyond the formal politics, and the personal becomes the political. Right, which is in fact what it should be. Um, a point of departure then as I shum shum everything. <laughs> um, I want to say that at Kubelani, as much as we can say, um, you know, it, um, in different contexts, uh, the, the naked female body destabilizes society in different ways. I want us to also understand that at the end of the day, all of these three case studies show us how inherent in our societies there's this violence against women. The fact that I even need to employ that method as resistance mm -hmm. shows how violent society is and how much it, it really takes and takes and takes away from me. Mm -hmm. um, so I want to argue that it, what society does is that it constantly puts us in a position where upper singers are as team, right? There's, there's, there's nothing else you can do. Right. Um, and like I said, even at the beginning, is that this, what this shows is a sort of intergenerational pain and trauma that much of even the speakers throughout have spoken about today. Um, and I think we can use, you know, the methods that have been employed by our mothers and our grandmothers, our great, great, you know, ancestors throughout time to actually resist in society. But I think that we need to reconfigure political space to understand other forms of protest as being legitimate, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And not legitimize this, this sort of heteronormative, militaristic, statist sort of thing happening, yeah? Um, and I think when I say there's a need to reconfigure, I'm not necessarily, because I also want to run away from this thing of we are constantly responding to whiteness. We are constantly responding to Eurocentrism, right? Mm -hmm. I want to say that when we need to reconfigure political space, it's about our own self-determination and self-definition there. So whiteness must not think that we are responding to them. It's not about them. Ne. Um, and so I think nakedness as resistance sort of gives us a site to theorize where a multitude of things are happening. Because I don't think it's only a situation of, you know, the strong black woman disrobing. I think that there are 
like we say that you know the black black women are you know inherent contradictions, we are walking contradictions. I think that in those moments where black women choose to employ nakedness as resistance, I think that there's so many things happening. We are but you're also strong. You are reclaiming, but there's I don't think it's just a you know strength or it's just a I don't know what else to do. Mm. I think it's all those things happening at the same time and them intersecting. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I think that's, that's it. Thanks for the Effective dimensions of naked body protests. But the paper I'm presenting today is called Nakedness as Decolonial Process. So I'm just going to read uh, the first few uh, uh, lines. The naked body has been a means of protest among African feminists dating back over a century. The upsurge in protest action in South Africa over the last decade has seen a rise in this form of protest. Once a working class woman's form of protest, naked body protest had now entered the realm of middle class um, university spaces and national events, such as the Women's Summit that we saw happening uh, in November last year. Uh, this paper examines naked protest as efforts to advocate for social justice, particularly against patriarchal oppression and state violence. Since uh, state violence and patriarchal oppression can be understood as colonial art effects with ongoing effects. These efforts can ultimately be understood as strivings for the colonial process. In this paper, I first explore a recording of a protest uh, that was staged in 1990 on the 12th of July by women in Luxonville against apartheid police coming to bulldoze down their shakes. Secondly, I analyze a radio podcast interview of women student podcast uh, protesters who staged a naked body protest during the feast must fall here in 2016 here at Through these two sources, I perform a critical discourse analysis to illustrate the significant role of women in fighting for social change and decoloniality. I demonstrate that the naked protest <coughs> transforms the women's body from social constructions of vulnerability and consumption to a, star, a side of militancy, defiance, and one that speaks from a position of solidarity and strength. Lastly, the paper explores the different affective registers experienced by these women during and after the naked body protests. So the women that I'm going to be quoting in here, I use uh, pseudonyms to protect their um, identity. Uh, so I don't use their, their real names. The paper is part uh, while the study is conducted in South Africa, the literature and sense-making of the processes will be informed by a body of work in the Global South, which traces naked protests uh, in different locales. For example, I look at the 1929 other women's um, uh, protest against uh, the, the, the colonial group who were imposing heavy taxes on women in those days. And I also look at that one of the 12th of July 1990 that happened in Dobsonville. I also look at the one that happened on the 16th of April 2015 in Uganda, where the women stripped naked in front of the Minister of Land and the Minister of International Affairs over a land dispute. 
I also look at the Rhodes uh, University uh, naked body protest that happened in 2016 as well as the one that happened here at Rhodes. So writing about decoloniality, Ngovu Kacheni assessed that what Africans must be vigilant of or what, or what they must be vigilant against is the trap of ending up normalizing and universalizing coloniality as a natural way of, of, of the, the, the world, of how the world should be. He asserts that it must be unmasked, resisted, and destroyed because it produced a world <coughs> order that can only be sustained through a combination of violence, deceit, and hypocrisy, and lies. So decoloniality is a way to relearn the knowledge of one's forefathers and one's foremothers that has been pushed aside, forgotten, buried, or discredited by the forces of modernity. And as uh, Costello has already uh, told us, or let us know, <laughs> according to Oya um the Euro-American uh, uh, way of, of thinking is the one that has been dominant and hegemonic about how gender should be theorized. She explains that this facilitates an emphasis on appearance and visible markers of difference, whether you're male or female, you're black or white, you're homosexual or heterosexual. And she rejects this biological uh, sex difference structure that the Euro-American um, scholars have um, advocated. She offers a post-colonial critique of Euro-American scholars and explains that gender was not an organizing uh, principle and she uses Yoruba culture to, to explain her uh, uh, theorizing. So she says, she argues that for age of, uh, you know, a chronological difference instead of the sex differences. And she said, according, for, for us to fully understand the colonial inferiorization that was placed on women, it is important to understand gender dimensions of Yoruba uh, and by, by extension um, African uh, dimensions. So if one uses the Yoruba example to think of pre-colonial Africa, it can be argued that it's important that to understand gender from an African perspective that does not construct women as inferior beings. So protesting women are thus claiming back their agency through their bodies and researching, asserting their equality. So they are claiming back their agency and claiming back their bodies to say enough is enough. I'm just going to look at some of the quotations that came from the analysis that I made. So the first one is the radio podcast where these two uh, great students were interviewed. And the question that was being asked was, are naked body protests necessary? And so the women were responding to this and there were people who called in to, you know, to chip in and say their, their, their pieces. So this is what one of the women said. Yeah, look, I think um, whether society likes it or not, um, Fordism is a different generation. And that's the generation that has refused. Maybe um, the naked protest is part of history, but they were not. Uh, maybe they were not directed. No, not a directed particular question. One of the questions that we have asked is to say decolonize, and we understand exactly what we mean by decolonization. We have refused to make our bodies be bodies. You are not going to tell me how to respond when I am emotional. It's my business. Whether you like it or not, uh, stuff it. You have to live with that because we are a generation. Fallism is a gener is a, another a certain form of resistance. We refuse to have our bodies police and we will respond as such. And so there were some male callers who called in. Somebody called in saying that the women are degrading themselves and they are degrading their bodies. How can we even be giving them a platform to come and reason out why they uh, protested naked. They shouldn't even have done that in the first place. Of course, there were other women who called you know, in, in, in solidarity and in support of what the women have done to say, but hang on, you cannot keep policing uh, women's bodies. You cannot keep body shaming uh, women and telling them how to respond, how to act, how to think. They are claiming back their agency. <coughs> And another quotation that came from um, the Dobsonville women. 
I actually went and uh, interviewed some of them. I, I was so happy when I found that some of them were still alive. The naked body protest that they staged back in 1990, most of them have, have passed away. So I'm actually happy I met some of them. And this is a, a picture that came from the the Star newspaper, which was shot on the 12th of July 1990. That's called a uh, day when uh, apartheid police came to bulldoze down their, their sheikhs. How the women ended up uh, erecting their sheikhs is because they didn't have land, they didn't have homes. And back then, when you were, women were subject to their men. You could not apply for a house or a, for a loan or anything without your husband's signature. So if you're a single woman, divorced woman with children, you were doomed. So, and I, I asked one of these women, so where were you supposed to raise your children? In the streets. What was expected of you? So, so when they erected those sheds and the police came and moved those down their, their, their sheds, that's when they staged this uh, protest. So she says, um, when we saw the police, we got out to see what they were doing. We saw that they had started to demolish our sheds. When I saw that they were coming closer uh, to my shed, I honestly took off my clothes and stood as naked as I was born. I took everything and threw it inside uh, my shake. I said, this shake of mine you shall never demolish. This shake I bought with my own money because you didn't give me a place to stay. You didn't even give me money to buy this shake. Then I said, strip off, strip off, strip off, strip off women. All women got up and stood still. Then the police stopped and left our shakes alone. So this comes from the the, the, the video where these women were interviewed uh, in 1995. And you can see the, how do I say it, the anger and the desperation and you can, it's like you can touch her through the screen as she speaks. The anger comes out to you and you like, yeah, you, you actually do feel it because at the end she even cries saying it was so painful to watch the shacks that they had erected because some of them were actually um, demolished and then you have nowhere to sleep that night and the police go back to their homes to sleep. You left like that. Yes, this is now from the radio podcast again, where uh, Dumi th threw back the question to, to the radio presenter and to the listeners to say, in response to the question of are naked body protests necessary or inappropriate. And she said, I find those questions so annoying. Mm -hmm. And to be fair, I mean not to be fair, like to be frank, unnecessary. I mean whose body is necessary? What questions are we asking when we say that? Whose body is necessary? Whose body is inappropriate? Who is deemed appropriate? Men piss on the street all the time. Yeah. Nothing is said about that. Yeah. Women are raped every day, and very little is said about that. So once again, I could—I remember even as I was listening to, uh, to this uh, program that day, I could feel goosebumps. So that element of affect when somebody is speaking with that anger and such that it travels through the radio to you. I had goosebumps as I was listening to her. Like, Yes, tell them that whose body is deemed appropriate. Are women's bodies going to be deemed inappropriate forever? For how long? Mm -hmm. It's like we say women's bodies should not exist. They should not be in existence. So she was asking all these questions and the radio presenter couldn't come back. Of course, it was not her duty to come back. It, she opened up the, the lines to, to the listeners you know, to, to come in and, and, and say, what they think, whether they agree or disagree with that. So what kind of work is performed uh, by naked body uh, protests? Sylvia Tamal and Sultana argue that in order to deprive the women's naked body protests of their radical content, patriarchal societies frame and label women protesters as primitive, crazy, and irrational. Participants cited in the preceding section also demonstrate that the body shaming is meant to control women's bodies. 
Tamal and Sultana assert that the naked bodies of protesting women are reconfiguring nakedness on their own terms and moving away from objectification. These naked body protests serve as strivings for uh, decolonial praxis. James just cautions that it is not right to just label protesters and their affective registers that they experience during the protests as irrational. According to Jasper, affects are part of social life. They are relatively stable and predictable, and they are not irrational eruptions. So some of the women, when, they, when I spoke to them, they said naked body protests for them served a cathartic, um, uh, it was cathartic for them because even if they get what they are protesting for or not, they, they feel that they've set their peace, mm -hmm. they've released this pent up anger that they've been feeling inside uh, of them. And there's a sense of relief at the end of it all to say, I've set my peace. Mm -hmm. I loved myself enough to not just sit mm -hmm. and not do anything about it. Because whether you sit or not, you're still oppressed. Mm -hmm. So you better love yourself enough to stand up and say, let me do something about it. Mm -hmm. Let me, you know, use my body and claim back my, my, my agency and, and, and my body and, and renegotiate, you know, the, the goalposts. From the affective point of view, the naked protests have proven to be cathartic for the protesting women, as of some of them has uh, stated uh, experiencing a sense of relief during and after the protest. Here's what, what uh, Tangsa said. Tangsa is one of the women who protested uh, in 1990 in the Dobson Hill protest. At the time when I was naked, I felt so powerful. The power given to hit a police. Mm -hmm. So when I met her, she told me that, because there uh, on the video, not everything was done, what was, what was put. So she told me that the police even scooped her with a, you know that? Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, and she was inside it. And they scooped her up, and down and up and wow. down. And I asked her, were you not scared during that time? She said, no. I felt so powerful that I could jump from that closer and grab him on his face and scratch him. But I was far from him because he was sitting inside the, the bulldozer. And she says to me, but I'm proud today because my children have a home, even though I have that affective shame also at the same time mm -hmm. to say how are my grandchildren going to, to feel or how are they going to see me to say great she was crazy how could she strip mm -hmm. naked mm -hmm. but I explained to my children at the time that I wanted mm -hmm. to have a home that today we can say our mother fought for our home we have a home today because she fought for us and the last quotation uh, uh, from Another Dobson Bill woman says, is saying, I also had a lot of strength and power, but I was also very hurt at the same time. So these are some of the, the, the you know the, the things that the, the women who protested negative have been going through. But they decided, you know, we love ourselves enough to use nakedness as decolonial praxis to say enough is enough. We're resisting patriarchy, we're resisting state oppression, we're resisting inequality, we're resisting all these oppressive um, <coughs> measures that are being placed um, against us. which critically analyzes and appraises the manner in which um, Professor Nathan Saure, um, as a male author, portrays his female characters as bold, resilient, and intelligent beings. 
Um, for this particular paper, I have chosen the character of Moniswa from Saleh's latest novel, in Kululego Isendabi. So the status of women in many African societies is burdened by negative male constructs, which in turn have become the abiding principles of society. Um, these negative perceptions are myths used to explain the natural order and to give justification and legitimize um, cultural practices. Some of the myths that are said about women are that um, women are fragile and inadequate, um, that they should endure all trials they face um, in silence, and also that women's role in society is just to get married and have children. However, the female character of Uboniswa proves that these myths are nothing but false. Um, Uboniswa is confident and unapologetic. Um, she is not afraid to um, ask the man that she really loves out, um, and she's not afraid to take the lead within the relationship. She is not afraid of turning down men who constantly burden her um, by declaring their love for her knowing fully that they are only um, after her beauty. Um, so, Lisa Lesaure tells us that Ugoniswa um, has to constantly battle these men um, and constantly has to battle this, these men and at times um, they are unable to accept rejection, therefore go around spreading false rumors about her and calling her names. Um, he says that in Dombi and Wuri, I see what it does in any cool, no cool seller is meaning that um, the young lady was fighting a constant battle trying to protect her, dig her virginity and her dignity. Okay. So Oboniswa is bold and intelligent. The <coughs> author taps into um, Oboniswa's childhood and tells us that um, So basically her name became popular because she was um, gifted in many ways. She was intelligent um, and she was involved in all school activities and was at the forefront of all of these. Oboniswa demonstrates African um, women activism by breaking free from the traditional institution of marriage, fulfilling African womanism theory principles. Um, for my methodology, um, this paper critically reviews social issues as they are portrayed in the novel, citing um, contemporary situations. The objective is to contribute ideologically in a manner that will change and create new informed attitudes regarding the way women are perceived in literature. It also aims at empowering women to be able to say enough is enough and walk away from toxic marriages. This paper draws from African feminisms as an umbrella and theoretical framework and I combine Ogunyemi and um, Walker's womanism, as well as Ogundipeleski Stewanism as the sub theories. Okay. I draw my analysis through three subheadings, namely being the loss of identity due to Ogunyamezela, which is endurance or perseverance. Um, the second one being the misconception of marriage as ikuku, a treasure or an achievement and the third one being cultural and traditional influences. So I start with the first one, loss of identity due to Ugunyamese. Okundi Pelesi observed that within the union of marriage, um, in most cases, the woman loses her identity. She is no longer viewed as her own person, but as her husband's subordinate. Um, her role is complex to define outside her marriage. 
Boniswa, for instance. We heard how strong and independent she was before marriage. However, the minute she became married, she was now known as Africa's wife. She suddenly lost her confidence. A woman who once was not afraid of leading her romantic relationships suddenly waited to be led in marriage. A woman who was not afraid to face any challenges um, head on now suddenly has thoughts of committing suicide as a wife. That's how intense her marriage, her marriage was. Bonizo finds herself losing total autonomy as a wife. The misconception of marriage as ibuku, treasure or an achievement. Bonizo's loss of identity is brought on by the misconception of marriage being viewed as a huge achievement in many African societies. As a result, men use marriage proposals as bait to lure women into their lives. In Imburulebo Isendabin, this is demonstrated by the male character of Africa, who had spent years trying to persuade Boniswa into being romantically involved with him. Sale tells us that Africa even resulted into saying, it is marriage that I am talking about. I am not toying with your heart. I want us to build a home. You will become a mother again for the child. Some women remain in loveless, abusive, and oppressive marriages, and others, like Ubonis, enter into these types of marriage uh, marriages afraid of being stigmatized afraid of being a disappointment to their families and, so and societies, as well as afraid of shaming their parents. Take the case of Ubonizwa. After years of turning Africa down, she got involved with the love of her life, Ubuyile, whom she was bold enough to, per to pursue herself. Um, Ubuyile is arrested for his political involvement in the, liberals, in the liberation struggle. Bonizo falls pregnant just before Buhile's arrest, but is unaware of the pregnancy. Um, Africa uses Buhile's arrest as a way of as a way of entering into Bonizo's life and drugs her, then um, rapes her. Ubonizo is unaware of the the sexual um, intercourse. But then all Africa assures her that um, he would never rape her, therefore there was consent. After some period, Bonizo discovers that she is pregnant and immediately tells Africa about this. Africa tells her the only solution to the matter would be for them to get married. Um, to save her from the shame of falling pregnant out of wedlock. And Bonizo agrees to this. And this becomes the trick um, used on many um, women by men. Um, cultural and traditional influences. Okundipe Leslie argues that due to societal and cultural pressures, women insist on having their children fathered, despite the emotional oppression and pain they often endure within marriage. Hence, my, hence the opinion that um, Culture and tradition play a vital role in African society. Society consists of socially constructed and transmitted customs and norms. However, because these beliefs are humanly constructed, therefore they can be easily manipulated. In, in patriarchal societies, these norms are <coughs> manipulated to suit patriarchal gain. For instance, um, Ebila tells us how the former Kenyan president views um, the image of a true African woman as one who is expected to be subservient, silent, and above all, a nurturer. Wives are told to endure and persevere in marriage regardless of the challenges they face. Uboniswa is disrespected by her husband. He no longer sleeps at home and seldomly even visits the house. Um, every night she prepares dinner for him 
with the hope that he would come back, as she was taught when she was young, that a woman needs to prepare um, food for their husband and ask no questions. He takes a second wife without approaching Wonisa about this decision. She finds out from a newspaper article that her husband is married again. Through it all, Wonisa's mother keeps on telling her that a wife enjoys in marriage. She sits upon her marital problems and awaits for things to become better. Um, even though Oboniswa had temporarily fallen into the patriarchal trap, she immediately went back to her senses. And upon an evening whereby Africa finally returns home, she questions his whereabouts. Uh, he is taken aback by this act because according to his understanding and tradition, um, women are not supposed to question their husbands. Um, as the husband has total authority, in the household. Kuboniswa realizes that she is in a loveless, abusive marriage. She decides to leave Africa and files for divorce, something that is frowned upon amongst her people. Kuboniswa rediscovers herself and reclaims her power and breaks free from the oppressive bondage of marriage. Um, she vows to herself to never become a man's slave again by saying, Thank you very much. Bonded, all of us, in the way that only women can bond when we are together in the space. Talking about menstruation, cooing during birth, and a number of other stories that you don't usually share with the weaker sex. Gabi <laughs> <laughs> um, shared and she, she spoke about growing up in Mlazi and moving to the town Midlands and having this life between the township and the English world, her religious views. She spoke about her son and her family. We were truly horrified to learn that the father of her child had been a very jealous, possessive person and had tried to kill her and her son. When she showed us her artwork, it was wonderful to see how she translated all of these life experiences into her creative visions. And I want to show you some of her artwork. Gabi was goodness and, and kindness personified, so you can imagine the collective shock and horror we felt when details emerged that she had been killed by her ex-boyfriend, another ex-boyfriend. We went for a funeral in Blasi, Durban. To this day, I don't know many details, but what several people who spoke from the podium said was that Gabi had been fearful for her life for several days leading up to her death, and as one preacher proclaimed from the platform, she had called him to say that she thought her ex was going to kill her, and he said to her, God was going to save her, and look, he had. Oh, oh my gosh. As a Christian, I remember feeling like I was going to throw up, mm -hmm. like all the air in the room had been sucked up. Mm -hmm. It seems Gabby's ex had been calling and threatening her. She had told several people. One night, he came over. 
came through the ceiling. She was on the phone with people who heard the, her terror as this was unfolding. As he came into our house and killed her, he died as well. Gabi survived by a son. She had bought a house a few years earlier, and like she told us while sitting and eating her spicy Robertson's chicken wings recipe, which I still make to date, when she died, her house was paid off and her son was taken care of. Gabi and Kursi's art continues to live today. We know as women in South Africa that nothing about Gabi's story is unique. The details cease to be horrific when women get chopped and liquefied in acid, when barely formed vaginas are brutalized. And yet I'm sure that even for those of us who know the statistics, that hear these stories often, there's alert in the pit of one's stomach that he came through the roof. My focus here is not on the violation of private space or the injustice we face. In fact, there are several times when I thought about, you know, when I, when I was thinking through this paper, which I first gave at a Me Too workshop, that I thought about withdrawing. It's just too much, too much to say, too much to do. Too much has been done and not enough has changed. Too much talk, not enough action. So much action and not enough results. So much results, but not enough long-term change. So much change, but why does it feel like we're right back where we started? Mm -hmm. Too much work, too much time. And then there's too much damn contradiction and too much absolutism. Every time I want to open my mouth to say something, I immediately want to contradict myself. So how can I support the absolutism of all men are? But how can I ignore the fact that the level of strategic absolutism has started a level of necessary discourse? But how can I also start a discussion that this is only one level of discourse? That the devils and the liberals, liberal races also lie in such absolutism. And black feminisms demand nuances and contradictions. And so I want to go back to that point in the narrative. He came through the roof. What is it about that narrativization that perhaps stops your, stops your heart, made you pause a bit, made your stomach lurch? Was it the violation of a private space? We think of a structure of a house. Here is a house, it is clean and white. It has a red door. It is very pretty. Here is the family. Mother, father, Dick and Jane lives in a green and white house. They are happy. From Morrison of the Blue's heart. Perhaps it is that the home is a safe space. That those white walls are all that is needed to keep out harm. Perhaps there is a red door with a brass knocker on it. That red door, when it is locked, keeps out harm. Perhaps the red door has a wooden brown fence with a little metal gate that clanks op when open. This wooden fence and this little metal gate keeps out harm. <coughs> As we sit safely in our, on our yellow couch inside our houses with the white walls and the red door and the green tiled roof, we imagine the dangers out there, beyond the fence and beyond the gate. We imagine we are safe only insofar as we are able to comprehend our proximity to danger both realistically and fantastically. We take as many necessary physical precautions as we think it is necessary to protect our assets and then we mentally dam up the space where we know that we are honestly not secure mm -hmm. and nestle into a necessary illusion of safety and security. We can then choose our entertainment medium of choice, a crimi novel, a horror movie, a series, and indulge in a wide range of fantasy by proximity. Thus, our ability to imagine ourselves in proximity to something is an important feature of our personal and social formations. Going back to the narrative, he came through the roof. Even though, though you don't know Kavisida and Kursi, I'm sure you share, share some horror at this detail, not just because of a private safe space being violated, but because you, on some level, imagine yourself in proximity to that same situation, the proximity that it could have been me too. I've taken a long time to come to the simple point, but it's because it has taken a long time for me to articulate the simple point for myself. 
As a creative person, I imagine myself all the time in various scenarios. Some might call this daydreaming, fantasizing. Some might cough at my bat or my violation of Denzel Washington in my head. But I don't think either of these words encapsulate the healthy mental enactments I indulge in for a variety of, of reasons. Even as a child, I was able to do this. When people told me stories or I read stories, I was transported beyond my body in the township, beyond my geospecific place and time to the space of the here and now of Malaysia. I cried, I laughed, and I angered with the characters in the story. To this day, I am still like this when I read books and watch movies. I am deeply affected. I have come to realize this as proximity factor. I can place myself in relation to the narrator and the narrated. So when this story of Gabi Sile is told, I am standing in front of Gabi as she holds the phone in terror, her sister on the line. I am on the roof with this calm but deranged ex who is removing tiles and coming through the roof. I am there as she's scuffling with him and the gun, and I am lying there thinking of my son, my dream spent as my life blood runs out of me. The proximity factor teaches me that there is power in the narration, who the narrator is, who the narrated is, but also why at times I have understood why it is necessary to say it is too soon for you to speak not now. When I read the Juno Diaz piece, I felt sorry for his tale of abuse. But when I read the dark-skinned woman left in the wake of his abuse speak up, I felt such proximity pain that I had not been prepared for it. I had gone to read an article on Diaz and not have my own hurt by men of color blazoned on the pages by other women. This was vagina proximity and feminine proximity. The Diaz issue brought up much conflict. Within this white and green house, a brown child was hurt by those who should have kept him safe. The danger did not come from outside, but was within. The child grows into a man and carries this hurt within and enters other white and green homes and terrorizes women inside them. He takes words and weaves them into beautiful magic which beckons the magical and the broken to him. He breaks the magical and scatters the broken. When he is gone, we are still left with the gift of story that he presented. But what to do with this piece of magical arts? Does magic exist without the magician? Should magic exist without the magician? And I want to think about proximity factor in relation to both the producer and the production, but also the audience. My magician growing up was MJ. I had grown up with Michael Jackson. In the racist world that I had grown up in, there was Michael and Janet and Whitney and Bob Marley. And, okay. and Jimmy and Aretha. White people had nothing on that shit. <laughs> but then Michael got whiter and weirder. <laughs> and the allegations kept coming and the proximity factor meant that I struggled to moonwalk with Michael when they were little kids in bed with a grown ass smash. But then he made the song, Have You Seen My Childhood? And he took me on a magical journey searching for the wonderment of that he had been denied and I empathized and momentarily understood why he chose to have kids around him. But also was like, nah man, you still can't do this. Mm -hmm. But then he went dangling babies out of windows and I had to banish my music because <laughs> shit was not just real around that man, it was hyper real. Mm -hmm. And we were fueling that hyper part. Mm -hmm. I remember hearing the news when Michael Jackson died. I felt relief. I put on my Michael Jackson songs. He was safe to hear again. Why? Because he wouldn't be dangling babies outside windows again mm -hmm. or having kids stay overnight at Neverland Ranch. When I put Michael songs on, we put Shimona together again and remember the pleasure of our body, bodies in rhythm, in dance like he taught us. Side note, this was before the documentary came out. <laughs> <laughs> He's been new to the game. 
1977, acclaimed French-Polish director Roman Polanski was arrested, charged, and accepted a plea bargain for the rape of a 13-year-old in the U.S. He, la he later renegated on the sentencing and still has a warrant for his arrest outstanding. In an unrelated event in his life, Polanski's partner Sharon Tate was murdered along with several people at the home of Polanski by the Charles Manson gang in 1969. She was pregnant at the time. The victim of the abuse, directors and actors, continues to advocate for the dropping of the case against Polanski. Film watcher Woody Allen was found to have naked pictures of Mia Farrow's <coughs> adopted daughter, Suhin Craven, whom he claims to have become sexually involved in when she was 21. They have now been married for over 20 years and have adopted two children. Allen's wife, Mia Farrow, reported that her daughter and two of her childminders claimed that he molested another of their adopted daughters, Dylan. The family remains divided on the abuse while Alan remains a sought-after director with actors and actresses willing to star with him for little or no money. Let's remember Woody Allen famously said, the heart wants what the heart wants. American actor Bill Cosby was found guilty in 2018 of three counts of aggravated assault and was sentenced to three to ten years in prison but has more than 60 allegations of sexual misconduct, drugging and rape made against him spanning decades. Top of the Pops presenter Jimmy Savile is said to have had a large network of predatory sexual offenders in the UK and has had over 450 complaints against him ranging from five, five years old to 75 year olds through his philanthropy, which, was even, which even gave him a room at one of the UK hospitals which allowed him to abuse staff and patients. Savelle died in 2011, but during his lifetime he even went so far as to sue his victims for making accusations against him. The Savelle case exposed a much larger predatory ring at work in social circles that includes access to hospital and bodies, to mortuaries, for necrophilia, and prompted investiga investigations into the National Health Services, the BBC, and related departments that covered up Seville's widely known pedophilia for decades. Since 2002, R&B singer and songwriter R. Kelly has been accused of making or having child pornography, including a video which shows him having sex and urinating on an underage girl and keeping various black women at his home, ordering their daily schedules in a sexual cult-like environment. In 1994, unbeknownst to her rather protective parents, 27-year-old Kelly secretly married 15-year-old R&B singer Aaliyah. When the marriage was discovered by her parents, it was quickly and quietly annulled and all contact with him broken off. In 1985, Cuban-American visual artist Anna Medieta was just 37 years old when she fell to her death from her 34th floor, floor apartment window in New York. Her death rocked the New York art scene with many claiming that Melieta had no reason to commit suicide as her career has just taken off and she was so scared of heights that her choice of suicide was unlikely. Her artist partner, Carl Andre, who was in the apartment that night and the couple had been, had been heard arguing by neighbors. Andre was tried and found not guilty on account of reasonable doubt. Andre's 911 call included the following. My wife is an artist and I'm an artist and we had a quarrel about the fact that I was uh, exposed to the public more than she was. And she went to the bedroom and I went after her and she went out the window. In 1982, South Korean poet, writer, director, novelist, visual artist, Teresa Hakim Cha was just 31 years old when she was raped and murdered by a security guard and serial rapist when she went to visit a building in New York being for documenting. In 2017, renowned South African visual artist Valerio Tetwa was incarcerated at Paulsmark Prison for beating to death a 23-year-old pro prostitute, Nokopila Kumalo, in 2014 in Woodstock. Prosecutor Christian, Christina van der Feyre put it to Yodikin that the court had rejected in Tetwa's memory loss argument as fabrication. He told him he found it strange that someone could stomp on another person 62 times and not recall such a violent act. In 2018, Standard Bank award-winning 
visual artist Mahal Madi Kaseng was reportedly held at an airport in Kenya following an episode in which he had a public argument with his fiance and was ranting at her and tore up her passport, leaving her unable to travel. Several passengers and staff had to intervene, and in some inexplicable situation, muse musician Simpiwe Dana Sama was called in and assisted in helping get Mohau released. I would like to return my question to proximity and magicians. At which point did you get near or further away from the proximity of placing yourself in the body of the abused and the magician? What was the line for you? What amount did the abuser have to do to justify the abuse or make the abuse understandable? How great was their language, their vision, their lyrics, their familiarity of your situation that granted them unrestricted access to their daughters, wives, partners' bodies? How cheap is the price of that movie ticket, that song, that exhibition against the huge price of personal and collective trauma that is being paid by victims of abuse daily? What was the point of escalation that made you draw the line? Urination? He came through the roof. She felt that he four floors onto the roof of the Delhi where she was afraid of heights. 450 complaints, age 5 to 75, necrophilia, stomped on her 62 times. What was your line of proximity, the line at which you put yourself next to that person and said no, no art, no genius, no canon, no cultural production is worth this. No, not now. Maybe someday, but not now. What was your line of proximity, the line at which you put yourself in the body of the person that has a dick whose actions might be misunderstood, who didn't understand the no, or didn't, or meant that, who thought that maybe it meant maybe, who thought that the person just needed a bit more convincing, who took silence for consent, who thought that it had gone too far for it to stop now, or was that line at which you put yourself in the vagina of that person and felt her humiliation at being beaten, of being violated, of being asked to suck dick for a job, of being pissed on, of being brushed up against, of being told not to be so emotional, of being held down and being brutalized, of being told to get over it and not being able to speak about it ever again because you will never be believed because of great fucking art. I am a visual artist. I work with visual productions every day. I know and I believe in the value of visual culture, but I know that the greatest trick that capitalist, patriarchal, white supremacy has done is fooled us into believing that the thing, the illusion, the product is more important than the magician. Mm -hmm. And that if we question the magic, then we will cease to exist. Mm -hmm. I hope you notice the similarities on all of these historical and contemporary Houdinis who have all indeed achieved brilliant magical feats, but the elephant is still in the room. Moreover, when there is a human life at stake, no amount of dumb metaphors like the one I'm using is good enough for dealing with human life crying out for help. There is no valid reason that a rapist should not be convicted for the sake of any artistic genre, nor can we continue to actively subsidize an artist's life knowing that when we play this song on Spotify, money will directly go to that artist uh, to run their sex cult and pay their lawyer's fees. My proximity to these real life women whose lives are at stake does not allow me to turn a blind eye as was done in Seville's case, as was done in Cosby's case, as was done in our family's case. And so I'm interested in how proximity of imagination to someone, to a body, to a situation can be galvanized into political action and imagination. In camera, Lucida Roland Barthes, looking at the picture of two young girls, notes that even looking at them in their youth, they are going to die. Susan Sontag reminds us that all photographs are memento mori. They remind us of the inevitability of death. Visual culture is a constant cycle of life and death and resurrections and loss and excavations. Visual culture death is never as final as it seems. Let us not to be, a, be afraid in this moment to let some artistic geniuses die. 
right now, so others may live. Deaths are inevitable, and visual culture resurrections entirely possible later. But right now, there are some others within proximity of our life breath. Thank you. It makes me kind of wonder if we knew we had safe spaces, mm. if ever in ways safe for us, because this credit was the outside, mm. so they will always come through the room. Mm. I think it's very important what you say about proximity, you know, stepping into that place of those experiencing this violence, because then we can see that we don't need a reason, we have reasons, more than enough reasons to react and protest. And like, um, Patricia said, um, was it on Thursday, that we are too reactionary. We are waiting for something to happen. But too many things are happening around us every day. So we really don't need, yes, there's a, there's a, uh, there's a time to come together and you know, do this mass protest and all that. But every day, I think our resistance has come to a point that it has to be every day, every moment. We are speaking up and resisting because there's so much to, to, to really resist. So any comments? Or will I engage them afterwards? Comments, feedback? Very short. Sure. Um, I love all your questions. Thank you so much. I think I think it's so interesting how I mean when I think about particularly in relation to all the conversations you're having with women and being buried today about how your conversations are also speaking to how women are moving further and further out of the public space because the public space that when we think we can come out and be safe is the space that's going to even further cause more violation. And so um, in and of itself, the space that we think that can protect us won't protect us, right? Um, and so it pushes women more into just being silent and just staying in the private, right? Um, yeah. <laughs> And, and the thing is, men understand proximity factor, right? The moment one of their daughters are violated, yes. 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 suddenly we get proximity factor. Mm -hmm. But I think part of the proximity factor is also when we are in proximity to these violations, that it says we have every right to be angry, mm -hmm. as angry as we are right now, to decide we want to mute certain people. Mm -hmm. That actually, right now, this anger and this moment is far more important in the history of our civilization as a whole mm. than it is about some great fucking art. Mm. And, and, the, and, and what interests me in the case of R. Kelly, in the case of Michael Jackson, in the case of Woody Allen, is the way in which visual culture products are used strategically so that art is not something neutral. But when, when Michael Jackson is releasing that song, when R. Kelly is I believe I can fly. Those are all very, very, very clear ways in which visual culture productions are technologies of abuse. Yes. Because they shift the narrative from the tension of the of the violated to the violator and creates makes us feel sorry for them. Mm. So who controls innovation is important. Mm. And and their lawyers understand that. Yeah. And so we mustn't look at artworks and these things as this, oh, I'm just playing a song so I can divorce the artist right. from, from the, the artwork, mm -hmm. you know? Uh, I, can, I can disregard R. Kelly singing Half on a Baby or Aging Nothing But a Number. I can never hear those songs, never. Mm -hmm. I'm literally conscious of some of these music efforts. Mm -hmm. But to understand the ways in which art are technologies of abuse, like in Woody Allen's case, when he plays that very geeky young man and you know, all his characters are these geeky things and then you, you ask to identify with his geekiness and how he gets at women. And look at the woman he gets at in his movies. It's, it's all part of the molest, molested culture, you know, that whole thing of cultivating. And we've been cultivating for so long, constantly to identify 
cultivate so long, divorce the person from their artwork. So for all of us, we are always embodied, except at particular times. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Sorry to end on a depressing note. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you so much.